Hi, I'm Ben Brooks, and I'm an outboss. Hello, outbosses. Rhodes Perry here, and welcome to episode number 57 of The Out Entrepreneur, a weekly podcast where I get to interview today's most inspiring LGBTQ bosses crushing it in business. I'm really, really excited on today's show to be interviewing Ben Brooks, who's joining us all the way from the Big Apple. So Ben, are you ready to inspire fellow out bosses? Absolutely. Great. A little bit about Ben. He is an executive coach and founder and CEO of the career improvement startup Pilot. After holding a number of executive and leadership roles at Lockheed Martin, Oliver Wyman, and Marsh and McLennan companies, Ben decided to utilize his professional development experience and start his own career in executive coaching firm in 2013. Pilot, his new tech startup dedicated to helping people be happy at work, launched in 2016. So really excited to learn more about Pilot and just to have you on the show in general, Ben. So to kick us off, why don't you let us know a little bit more about your business and what makes it unique? Absolutely. Well, Pilot, you know, I got tired of working for companies with two word names. So I made a one word name company, but I, <laughs> I, I, created, I created Pilot because I saw so many people in careers struggling and not struggling from the sense of not getting a job necessarily, but often being in things that looked on paper like they were very good or successful, but people feeling frustrated and stuck and confused. And I had just figured out through mentoring and the executive coaching that I had had myself and a variety of other things, you know, a way to get ahead at work that just seemed to be not available to other folks. And so, you know, I had built this executive coaching and business coaching practice and worked with a lot of amazing entrepreneurs, very, you know, diverse people, which we'll talk more about later. And I thought, how do we bring this to more people? And I saw the two fundamental problems with executive coaching is it's super expensive. You know, the the median price for an executive coach in the United States is $500 an hour. And typically coaches won't work with people for less than 10 or 20 hours, you know, minimum. And the other thing is it's, it's, um, you know, a nine to five in an office sort of thing and not a mobile on demand sort of thing like we're used to doing with everything else in our lives. And so what Pilot does is it offers an entirely new way to maximize employee potential by democratizing executive coaching and letting employees manage their own careers in a smart way. In, in terms of democratizing the executive coaching, what, what do you mean by that? Just to kind of break it down for our, our audience. Well, I love airplanes and airlines and aviation, hence why I named my company Pilot as part of it. And I use this analogy that if you think of an international aircraft, right, from a big airline, You'll have international first class and you know, champagne and caviar and cashmere. And that's where maybe the C-suite is, you know, in terms of what they're getting for their development. They may have their own coach and they go to executive education and these big off sites. And yet, you know, the majority of the plane, both on square footage and seats basis, is kind of underserved, especially in economy. And that's where most employees are. So we're trying to provide a more premium offering to kind of help the underserved get the sort of offerings that the front of the front of the cabin has and at a fraction of the price. And so we're helping people that otherwise most of the vast majority of members, the end users of Pilot, have never had a formal executive or career coach. Most of them do not have a mentor, but they're often, you know, high value talent with a lot of potential. And so the democratization is we're giving people executive coaching before they're executives. That's super smart. And I, I love what you're doing. It, it's absolutely needed. The world of coaching seems like it, it's exploding in, in lots of different directions. And I'm curious, from your perspective, and you've been doing this since 2013, full-time as an entrepreneur, what has you most inspired about the field that you're in and, and where do you see it growing? What's its potential? What I'm most inspired by is the currency that I think that really matters most to me in my career, which is impact. And coaching, I see, is a vehicle to have massive impact. I've helped absolutely change people's businesses, careers, and lives. And it's incredibly satisfying to me to know that I make such a difference. And I think that a good coach, not not all coaches are good, and part of a growing industry is it can be a bit of the Wild West. But there are many really great coaches in different domains out there, and the industry is expanding because there's, you know, I think there are limitations from a seven things you should never do in a job interview blog post. That's not going to really make a difference. And oftentimes people even know what they need to do, but it's the doing of it that makes the difference. And they're not doing it. People know how to lose weight, but they don't do that, right? So coaching is an exciting field to be in because it's helping people create the things that they really want that are part of living a really extraordinary and great life. And I get to be a part of that, which is a very, very exciting thing to be a part of. Yeah. To see that personal transformation and to really 
hold people accountable to where they want to go, even when they know what they need to do, like just to have that extra push is, is huge. So, um, so definitely I can see how, how rewarding the, a career in coaching is or, or can be. Take us back to 2013, if you can, at that moment where you were ready to kind of leave the two name companies that you worked for in the past to start out on your own. What was your primary motivator? Were you largely purpose-driven because you wanted to make an impact on people's lives and you knew that you could? Or you know, was it more because you were tired of trying to conform to a workplace culture that didn't really value all of who you are? You know, was one kind of stronger for you than the other as a, as a force to getting started? The funny thing about me being an entrepreneur is I never wanted to be one. And I never thought about being one, even though like my grandfather was an entrepreneur and got some of that in my family. I, I never thought, but mind you, all of my friends and, and colleagues and families saw me as that one day. So I was the last to know it found me before I really found it. And, you know, I had taken some time off of, I had left my previous position. I was a senior vice president and I had done really well in winning awards and, you know, it'd been promoted a lot. And very successful, but I, you know, was was in an environment that, despite all of our success, it, it was a bit daunting. You know, I had a, a manager, uh, one of my managers in the C-suite. One year, she gave me a very expensive and beautiful pair of cufflinks, and we were, at a, you know, a very business formal suit sort of culture. And there were these fish, and I thought, oh, that's interesting. I mean, I like I like fish, but I'm wondering like why fish. And she said, it's because you have to swim upstream all the time around here to get anything done. Mm. And I just got a little fatigued, frankly, I think of being in an environment. And I think change agents and people that are entrepreneurial at companies get a little fatigued because it's oftentimes, you know, companies are really structured to not be changed, to kind of be very steady. And in some ways, it's a very good thing for companies, but it was frustrating for me. And my plan was after quitting to take a little time off and I was going to get a job somewhere else. I thought about being the head of HR at a mid-sized company and I'd been interviewing to do that. And it was through some executive education that I went to a week-long course. They put a name tag on me and I said, Ben Brooks, entrepreneur. And I said, no, 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 I'm, I'm unemployed right now. I said, I, I should say unemployed. And they said, well, we are assigning you to a group and you're in the entrepreneurs group. And none of the other groups really made sense for me to join. And so I shrugged my shoulders and I said, okay. And by the end of that week, I was in this tribe, this group I was in, where they were, they were like my people. And I was driving home, I was in Washington, D.C., and I was driving back to, to New York. And I really, again, started to consider this idea of being an entrepreneur and not knowing, didn't have a business plan, didn't have a product or anything like that. But I took it from kind of an ontological perspective, from the place of like being, like who I was going to be and the identity I was going to have was potentially entrepreneur. And I saw a fork in the road that I could be entrepreneur or executive. And I had been, you know, an, an employee, right? And I had been an employee and I had had a lot of satisfaction and a lot of success in doing that. So I wasn't against like working for a big company or for the man. I always saw myself as a corporate sort of person. So I wasn't disgruntled about necessarily big companies. I was fatigued, but not disgruntled. But I just thought to myself, let me take on the identity of being an entrepreneur and see what manifests from there. And I'll get, and I thought to myself, you know, let me, let me give myself two years to see what happens. And that was, I think, in April of 2013 right when I had started my business. A lot of what you're saying really resonates with my own journey and just that idea of being entrepreneurial inside structures that, as you said, sometimes aren't designed for, for change or at least the change that you envision to kind of take that business to the next level. And I think kind of falling into it, or I liked what you said where entrepreneurship found you before you really kind of owned that identity before you found it. And I think that there's, there's a number of folks that, that listen to the show where they're still, they're still an employee mentality. They're still kind of toying around with the idea of being an entrepreneur and owning that identity. And there's either some fear around that or kind of a resistance to it. And I just, I like your journey. It's a, it's a little bit different. So thank you for, for sharing that. You had mentioned talking a little bit about diversity in your own business. And I'm curious, you know, having come from a more corporate background, what's one thing that you do in your own business today to create a, a more inclusive environment for those folks that you work with, especially for folks who often have felt excluded by dominant kind of workplace or corporate culture? Let me add one more thing on the entrepreneurial piece that there's a lot of we idolize entrepreneurs right now in the media and our culture and, and being an entrepreneur in some ways is really great. It's also really hard and difficult and sometimes horrible. And so what I kind of, what pilot really stands for is we help activate employees as entrepreneurs in their own careers and at their own organizations. And so it doesn't necessarily require you to quit your job 
job to think and act entrepreneurially. And in fact, the entrepreneur competency is now amongst senior executives at companies, one of the hottest commodities to hire for and to develop because they need people that can be agile and that are creative and that have very good leadership skills and that, you know, are great problem solvers and all the things they're willing to take some risk and that are curious and you know, multidimensional whole systems thinkers, all these things is becoming a very hot sort of commodity. So, so as people are listening to this, know that, you know, it may be uh, a multi-step process. It may, 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 you may never become an entrepreneur on your own business per se, but it doesn't mean you can't be entrepreneurial in how you get things done right where you are right now. Yeah. I think that that's spot on. And, and I think that for many of the guests that have been featured on this show, especially when giving advice to getting, you know, people thinking about taking that leap is really kind of looking within and making sure that you are wired <laughs> for that level of, of risk and that you can still use those same skills inside of, of big structures. And I love what you're saying where, you know, to be entrepreneurial is, is a hot commodity. So something for the, for, for the audience to think about <laughs> and Absolutely. where you're at in your own journey. So going to that, that question around workplace culture, is there something that comes to mind in your own business that you're doing to really welcome and encourage you know, high potential, diverse talent? Yes, absolutely. Many different things. And one of the great, one of the great, you know, there's many downsides to being an entrepreneur. One of the great upsides is having uh, a lot of control and autonomy over what you do with your own team and your own culture. So you know, we've hired and engaged with both members of our team and then uh, suppliers and partners that are incredibly diverse. And I think being a diverse person myself, I just have more of an empathy and a sensitivity to the fact that we're wired different. We come from different backgrounds, and that's not only okay, but it should be celebrated and uh, looked at beyond just an HR system and, and you know, metrics, but really uh, in someone's perspective and worldview. So, you know, my team and, and how we operate, we do share. We, we know about people's personal lives. We know about things, you know, that related to what matters to them. And frankly, I find diverse people more interesting to consider as candidates. We'll always hire the person who's the most qualified, but I make sure that when we're hiring that our pipelines and our slates include diverse people and diversity beyond just demographics, you know, their background, their worldview that, you know, what Sheryl Sandberg calls, you know, cognitive diversity and how they think and their opinions, because it makes for a stronger product. It makes for a better company. And so really, it's not like this nice to do wonderful, you know, motherhood and apple pie thing. It makes us competitively, you know, stronger. In particular, more so, so in a startup than anywhere else, because you know that diversity can have a massive impact in a short period of time. Yeah, everything that you're saying around the control and autonomy over building your own team—that is definitely one of the perks of of building out your own business. And especially, I think for a lot of the folks, most of the listeners are a part of the Rainbow family. Many people know exactly what it feels like to, to have to cover some aspects of your lived experiences at work in order to fit in or to get promoted on the team or whatnot. And no one wants to build a culture like that in their own business. So or I would say very few people who, who tune into this show. So mm -hmm. really, really great wisdom there. So thank you for sharing that. I'd like to kind of focus now more on your own identity yep. as, as you come to the LGBT community and how that shows up in your business. And, and I'd like to start first, if you could, over these past couple of years of being your own, own, own boss, how has it been, like, have you encountered a, a struggle or a difficult time where you, you felt like you had to cover some aspect of your sexual orientation or your gender identity because you were afraid of potentially losing a client or a revenue source or or just not feeling safe or that you would be valued. Does something come to mind? And if so, how did you work around it? Because I know that there are a number of, of folks in the audience that struggle with this around how out can I be in my business and always any kind of guidance that you have around your own experiences is always helpful to share. Yeah, you know, fortunately, I live in Manhattan, New York City, so I am surrounded by generally people that are more inclusive and more tolerant. And so I think that some listeners may be, they may not be in the United States, they may be or part of the United States that is much less evolved or tolerant in that regard. So I think that my experience is contextual to, you know, where I operate and where I live. And so I've been, I've been very fortunate in that regard. And, and we'll talk more in a, in a bit, I think about, you know, the fact that, you know, being LGBTQ has been an asset to me in my business. But I think that, you know, I actually had, I had more issues in my profession, like when I was a management consultant, 
where clients would get weird or say comments or things like that. Or when I was in the defense contracting industry, I had some, some experiences that were, were negative as well. And so I've been very fortunate in, in you know, the way that I think about it is I, you know, it, because I'm not at a, a position of survival, and I think if you're at a position of survival, kind of all bets are off and you think about things very differently. But if I'm not in a position of survival, I, I generally don't want to offer my gifts and my talents. I'm a bright guy. I, I produce great results. We have a great product with Pilot. As a coach, I'm a, I think I'm a fantastic coach. Why would I want to give that to someone that's not okay with my people? And so I look at it as, you know, in some ways, that like maybe they're not worthy of, of, of my services or my talent. And I generally is a part of, you know, one of the great advantages. I don't have any, any employees or colleagues that are incompetent or that are jerks or anything else or that are bigoted. And why should I have customers or clients that are that way either? Because this is, there's enough risk that I'm taking, enough things I'm doing on my own. I, I edit and I filter. And I, you know, I think if you're coming in a place of scarcity and you're, you know, wanting to put up with people in that regard, I, I think that one, I think the vast majority of people are not that way. And sometimes we fear that they are, but they're not. But if they are, um, those are just generally not the kind of people that I want to be um, using my services with and, and spending time with. Yeah. And that's something that is a, a theme that comes up for a lot of guests is by virtue of being themselves and, you know, fortunately for, for a number of people to live in progressive places like New York City, there is that advantage of putting your whole self out there and attracting your dream clients, at least people that are like, oh, you know what? I, I like what Ben is offering. I want to hear more. And, and they trust you because you're able to be 100% of yourself all the time. And, and also, I like that you recognize that not everybody in this country and especially around the globe is necessarily in that same position. There's a lot of folks that are operating from a place, as you said, uh, of survival or, or scarcity because it's, it's difficult just to be LGBT and in the workplace, it's not safe to be out. So that's very real and not to kind of minimize that at all, but like to show Absolutely. kind of the silver lining as you did. Absolutely. And I think that that's where I think it's, it's easy for people in big coastal cities to say, oh, like be out and things. But, yeah. you know, if every individual knows their own situation best. And if they're feeling that their safety is at threat or other things. They, they know better than, than me on this podcast telling them what to do. And so I think you have to take into their, their own context. And, you know, a long time ago, I think when I, when I was at my first job out of college was at Lockheed Martin, and I had a secret defense you know, uh, DOD clearance. And we had training about getting blackmailed. And LGBT was a part of that, because if we weren't out, and then, um, you know, enemies of the United States realized that they could actually use that against us in a way that would compromise the secrets of the government, right? And so the, the key was to, to, you know, to, you know, if you had any, whether it's a gambling addiction or you're, you're, you're gay or whatever it may be, you're supposed to disclose it to the company and they weren't going to hold it against you. And I've always thought about that, that I never wanted my LGBTQ status to be something that could be leveraged against me. And so, you know, when I started to do more things that in the public eye, when I was in the corporate employee, speaking at conferences or certain media and things, I made a conscious effort to list as an accomplishment of mine, LGBT related accomplishment, or, you know, when I was on a board of directors, you know, national LGBT board of directors, or I, I co-founded the LGBT employee resource group at my management consulting firm. And I would include that. And it's out in the public domain. I can't reverse that. It's just out there. And so it was never a secret. I even put it in my, my Twitter bio and things. And I had colleagues that were in Turkey and in Saudi Arabia and things that one, you know, even at an event in Europe once, you know, took exception to kind of my outness and flaunting whatever. And they were a very senior executive of, of the company. And uh, we were able to have it, you know, we, we kind of agreed to disagree. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't overly a, a pleasant exchange, but it was the sort of thing that I wasn't going to back down. At. And I kind of took the first step rather than it be the sort of thing that someone could find out. That ideally, again, if people have a problem with me being LGBTQ, I'd rather them see that up front and never engage with me in the first place and filter themselves out rather than to come up later or the onus be on me to come out. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you for sharing that just from your experiences of being an employee and how you navigated around that and, and still taking a calculated risk of, of putting something either on your resume or on social media just to kind of say, you know, not necessarily saying that you're out, but that you're affiliated with an LGBT group yep. and, and people make assumptions however they want to do so. So this show is definitely not about doom and gloom, right? It's about empowerment. Mm -hmm. And yep. one of the things that I really like to highlight and ask my guests is just thinking about your own lived experiences, being a part of the LGBT community. Clearly, just the coming out process in and of itself is a unique event for, for many of us that occurs again and again and again. So I'm curious, like with all of those lived experiences, 
what, what do you see as transferable to being a business owner? And how do you see LGBT business owners in particular having a competitive advantage in certain respects for being a part of the rainbow family and having to, to navigate some of the more difficult things that comes along with that? Well, it's interesting. I think that this would be a fascinating topic to, to have more research done on, or maybe it's been done and I haven't seen it, but I would imagine that there's a lot of parallels. I think just, you know, number one, the courage to come out was, is, is a bit of like the courage to launch a business, the courage to try something new. I think, you know, LGBT people different than other minority statuses. And, you know, obviously some LGBT people are multiple minority statuses, but, you know, you, if, if you grow up in a family that's, you know, Latino or Asian or black, like, you're, you're most of the time, your family members are also that. And you're having this kind of shared experience. When I grew up, I was the only LGBT person in my house. And so I didn't have, it wasn't like we we're all in this together. I was kind of on my own and feeling different and separate and needing to sort of figure that out and find my crew and, you know, go through that discovery and that learning, including making mistakes. All these are very, very transferable to being an entrepreneur, of needing to find the right tribe and do the right networking and allowing yourself to, to make mistakes and go through various phases of development and, and really, you know, be comfortable being on a different path. As much as it may seem like empowering to, quote unquote, be your own boss, it's also a bit strange sometimes because it's like, wow, it looks like there's a herd of people marching in, you know, to the south and I'm, you know, walking to the north. Am I on the wrong path here? It's a little bit lonely or whatever. And, and so I think the LGBT experience of just knowing that you're on a different path and that's okay. And that can be celebrated as another sort of parallel to being an entrepreneur. Yeah. And it, it, it kind of goes back to the story that you shared about going to that conference when you were in between jobs and <laughs> someone just kind of labeled you as an entrepreneur and you're like, wait a second, that's, that's not it. And you got connected to a tribe of other entrepreneurs, you know, I think for some of us in our own kind of coming out journeys, I, I think some people can resonate with that where maybe someone within the LGBT community is like, hey, you're one of us. And <laughs> maybe you haven't yep. come out to yourself yet, but it introduces yep. that thought and you're like, oh, I am. Right. And so, yeah, I agree with you. I think there's a ton of parallels and I, I hope that research is being done around this. Certainly, you know, with the show and people answering this question, I hope that's contributing to at least like qualitatively. What, what those parallels are. But I definitely think just the resiliency that we have from experiencing some of the, the microaggressions that we had endure, uh, like outright discrimination, you know, makes us stronger and we get kind of like shaped by the fire. So just kind of considering all of the, all of the challenges that some of us have to endure, you know, in, in business just to be out and obviously all of the advantages. What would you say to the listeners, you know, regardless of if they're entrepreneurs or thinking about becoming an entrepreneur, about how to be more authentic in their work or in the workplace? Well, I think that some people think of authenticity as this on-off switch. And it's either like I'm just this sterile corporate, you know, clinical cold vessel of a machine of work, or I am full blast, fully self-expressed, you know, no filter, et cetera. And I think that authenticity, you want to think about it in, in a way that is appropriate for the structure of the relationship. So, you know, if you've worked with a colleague for six years and traveled all over the world together, that's a pretty strong structure. And there's probably a lot that you can share and be open with. If it's uh, someone and it's their first week of work and you're having lunch together, that's there's less of a structure, right? And so I think that being authentic in a contextually appropriate way matters. And you know, Bernie Brown wrote Daring Greatly, one of my, one of uh, one of my favorite books. And authenticity is a big theme. It's really a book about overcoming shame. Very, very something that can resonate with a lot of LGBT people. And the thing that she says is, gosh, we all strive to be so perfect, and whether that's in our looks or in our success or anything else like that. And we just want to be this most perfect version of ourselves, you know, and the Instagram is kind of the, the manifestation of that sometimes. And yet what attracts us in, to other people is actually the vulnerabilities and the flaws and the mistakes. That's what has us fascinated and drawn in and relating to. And so I think that what I learned in my career is I had a, a colleague of mine say, Gosh, Ben, you know, a lot of people this in, in my team don't really like you. And, and I don't, and that's unfortunate because I like you. And he's like, I think what's, what the issue is, is they see you as perfect, which I, I just actually literally laughed out loud because I'm like, the, I feel like I'm the least perfect person. You know, just look inside my, my briefcase or something like that, right? Um, it's a mess. And, you know, and, I, and he said, you just need to show them that you put your pants on one leg at a time and that you make mistakes and you have these, these sort of things and, you know, kind of reveal some of my humanity. And I think I was so focused on being successful and over-indexing on that 
that I failed to really connect with them just as fellow people, including the fact that like I F things up every once in a while and I get anxiety or that I can be insecure or whatever else it may be. When I started doing that, I just um, was a much safer person that they could relate to. And so sometimes this authenticity is not just about, you know, one thing related to me being a gay man, but it was around the, the whole experience of me just being a person. Yeah, I, I love what you're saying. And, and especially around like considering the structure of every relationship that you have, whether it's at work or beyond, right? And, and it's almost like thinking about the depth of that relationship and to go further, you know, to strengthen that relationship. It's about sharing, whether it's sharing something about your sexual orientation and your family or about the failures that you've had in the profession that you're in, it makes you more relatable, right? You're not a robot. And and I think that that's, that's a lesson that, that many of us have to learn because we've been programmed by baby boomers and traditionalists, you know, if you're, if you're Gen X or younger, right? And for those generations in particular to share any kind of vulnerability is almost like a it's, it, it's a compromise in your armor. It makes you look weak. And it's, I, I love Brene Brown. I love that you mentioned her book because it, th- in fact, that's not, you know, that, that it's a strength. And if you can speak about it, you know, it takes the shame away from it because you're shining a light on it and it could help someone who's been in a similar situation, right? Like the more that you can, can share um, some of the things that, you know, make you scared to share <laughs> about your lived experiences. So I, I really, really, I appreciate you sharing that. For our listeners right now, we're going to take a short sponsorship break, but please don't go anywhere because when we return, we're going to get the chance to know Ben just a little bit better. Aspiring out bosses, are you struggling with taking that first entrepreneurial leap? Does the imposter syndrome prevent you from getting started? Have you considered seeking support, but you're just not sure where to turn? Look no further. The Out Entrepreneur now offers a coaching and mentorship program where you can access support and strategies to shift your mindset from employee to entrepreneur. If you're looking for accountability and a mentor who successfully busted out of the nine to five lifestyle, let's schedule a time to talk today. Visit www.outentrepreneur.com and look for show notes from today's episode to schedule a call. Again, the URL is www.outentrepreneur.com. Together, let's welcome you to the wonderful world of being an out boss. Welcome back, out bosses. We are now going into our bonus round where we'll have the chance to get to know Ben a little bit better, gain some insights on how we can bring our whole selves to work, and then learn how to stay in touch with Ben after today's conversation. So, Ben, are you ready for some quick fire questions? I'm ready. All right, here we go. So, in one sentence, what does it mean to bring your whole self to work? I think it's being forthright, which is more than being asked about something. It's sharing what's going on with you, whether you're asked or not. Yeah, I think that's great. What's one personal habit that helps you master yourself and your business? Meditation. I meditate every day in the morning for 20 minutes. I haven't missed a day in the entire year. I missed probably two days last year. It's a critical habit for me. Whoa, you are my inspiration. I try to do it every day and i <laughs> not as disciplined as you. So I, I like when... I have guests who, who talk about meditation because I do, I agree. It helps you get clarity, especially in the morning. It just it brings an additional sense of calmness. <laughs> and by the way, it's actually easier to do every single day than to do it sometimes because every day is a very easy thing to measure. Right, exactly. I agree with that. Like there's some things that I, I definitely do every day. Like um, for me, like moving my body, I'm really committed to working out. That's huge. It's the quieting in the mind that I have to also integrate mm-hmm. into that. But I agree. And so name, name one thing that you readily delegate in your business to stay focused on what you're good at. I delegate about a thousand things. Our Asana instance for our company is, is probably overloaded with what I delegate, but things around research, scheduling, you know, bookkeeping, you know, in, in administration, technical sort of operations, anything that, you know, I'm not uniquely qualified to do, I try to not do. Yep. Great advice. And Asana is a great piece of at least project management software. So, and in one sentence, do you believe that the, well, I don't know if it's one sentence, so, um, but do you believe that the current administration is good for LGBT businesses or does harm to them? Definitely think it does harm to them. I think if you look at policies related to immigration, you know, that's certainly one example, but, you know, I think the larger instability and, and massive void and lack of just general leadership and independent of policy positions, I think the you know, the clown show that we're seeing creates, you know, uncertainty and uncertainty is not good for business. It doesn't have people invest. It doesn't have people make discretionary spending decisions, et cetera. It doesn't let the markets behave in a certain way. 
And I think that the um, inability for the administration to really deliver on even the promise, whether I agree with them or not, they're not they're not really finishing the swing on anything that they say they'd like to do or want to do. It's a lot of bluster and rallies and things, which, again, you know, like corporate uh, tax reform would be you know, potentially fantastic. But when it's a banner or a talking point or a hashtag rather than a detailed policy then that's not good for business either. So I think that, you know, it's independent of the policy positions, you know, in addition to some policy positions, which I think are inherently anti-LGBT business and anti-business in general, uh, despite what you might assume, I think that just complete lack of sophistication and leadership to actually get anything done is a bigger threat to LGBT businesses. Yeah. And I think what you're saying on that as well, just from from a business perspective, Uh, perspective is on the lack of leadership. To run your own business, you have to be a strong leader. So when you have these great ideas, you have to have thoughtful planning and execution, which is like 90% of the work, right? And I think for this particular administration, regardless, like you said, on whether you agree with like the policies or the rhetoric around the policies, there's a lot of that and it exists on social media for sure. There's absolutely a lack of thoughtful planning and zero implementation on, on, on this. So thank you for sharing your perspective on that. I think it's helpful. Before we go, can you share one way that we can stay in touch with you and your business? Absolutely. So I share a lot on LinkedIn. I would love to connect with anyone listening on LinkedIn. You can look me at Ben Brooks NY. So LinkedIn.com slash IN slash Ben Brooks NY or just search Ben Brooks. You'll find me. Look for the bearded guy with a smile. Uh, otherwise, on Instagram, I'm also Ben Brooks NY, and I do share a lot of my Instagram stories, uh, a little bit behind the scenes of being an entrepreneur, which usually looks like me looking tired and working long hours and being in the back of an Uber. But you know, you see the uh, much less glamorous side to it, which I think is very important to share. And so, Instagram and LinkedIn, uh, where I, where I do a lot of my sharing, on, you can follow me on Facebook. All my posts are open to the public as well. Great, thank you, Ben. And we'll be sure to include all of the ways to find you in the show notes. And for our bosses, thank you so much for tuning in again to this week's episode. It's always a privilege to connect you to so many out and inspiring bosses like Ben. So as a next step, definitely visit the iTunes page and consider leaving a rating and review there. And please be sure to share the show with a friend. And for now, keep being your authentic selves 100% of the time.